Welcome back to Marvelous Videos. I'm Rylan, and this is Xenomorph, Detailed Anatomy Explored, analyzing the most dangerous alien species. While the Alien franchise has introduced us to some unique creatures, the Xenomorph stands out as the most dangerous alien species. They have a huge role in the popularity of this franchise due to their bone-chilling appearance and their distinct anatomical features. The creators also put a lot of effort into their finer details of these characters, and some of these details may have even gone unnoticed by most of you. So today, we will be exploring every aspect of the xenomorph's anatomy and tell you everything about its unique physiological features. But before we get into our explanation, we do have one very small request. If you like our content, then please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is just a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thanks. Now, let's begin. What is the basic physical structure and appearance of the xenomorph? Xenomorphs were huge creatures with gigantic heads, arms equipped with sharp claws, as well as long tails. Their claws had the ability to slash through almost everything, and xenomorphs typically had four to six fingers across the franchise. Their tails were also sharp enough to impale someone to death. Their size usually depended on the size of their host's body, but they were typically about seven to nine feet tall. They weighed about 180 to 272 kilograms, while some of their subtypes, such as the jock xenomorphs, were gigantic creatures who greatly surpassed other xenomorphs in height and weight. Even the xenomorph queen was typically twice as taller as the other xenomorphs, and some queens were even as tall as 30 meters. Xenomorphs shared some features, such as a dark exoskeleton, a vertebrae-like body, an elongated head, as well as a tail. Their heads typically had a secondary inner jaw, and their mouths resembled the jaws of a moray eel that uses its inner mouth to eat food instead of its outer mouth. There were a lot of individual differences among the basic features, as they varied depending on the host's body's features. Xenomorphs were primarily known for their plasticity and were flexible creatures who adjusted to their host's body. They incorporated the genetic material of their host along with some other mutations and artificial alterations. For instance, a xenomorph with a dog host body would have a canine body structure, such as digitigrade legs and enhanced speed, while a xenomorph with a human host would typically be plantigrade, that is, walking on two feet. Even with human hosts, there were height, weight, and other physical differences amongst the xenomorphs. Some of them had tails that were as long as their body, while others had tails that were even longer than their bodies. Typically, a xenomorph's tail was equipped with a sharp stinger at the end, allowing them to impale their victims. These creatures had hives made out of resin, and the xenomorph's body would produce this resin with the help of their saliva. They also reproduced asexually through a process known as parthiogenesis, and they had distinct stages in their life cycle. Exploring the Mysteries of the Xenomorph Physical Body Xenomorph's Outer Skin In general, xenomorphs were designed to become killing machines, and their bodies were even created with the help of a substance known as protein polysaccharides. Furthermore, these alien creatures could replace their surface cells with a heat-resistant polymer known as a polarized silicone that gave them a tough exterior. Their exoskeleton could be compared to a lobster, and it was impenetrable to almost every form of weapon, except for some high-powered firearms. Xenomorph's head. A xenomorph's head was one of its essential characteristics, and it was an elongated structure that somewhat resembled a banana. Their heads didn't have any eyes, but they did have some small black eye-shaped features that blended in with the rest of their features. It is even assumed that their eyes may be hidden under a layer of skin, so they might not be visible. Their eyes could have been sheltered beneath the black carapace features on their head, and they might have been able to see through it. Another theory suggests that their entire head is just one giant eye, but their eyes didn't really serve many purposes. Xenomorphs typically look locate their prey by sensing pheromones, but this theory still needs to be confirmed in the franchise. Xenomorph Secondary Jaws Their secondary jaws, also referred to as their inner mouth or double jaw, were one of the most disturbing features. These inner jaws were also known as attack tongues, and they were muscular appendages powered by the muscles inside their enormous heads. Due to these muscles, the xenomorph's jaws could easily lash out or even retract within their mouths. Their jaws could be compared to chameleon tongues that lash out and quickly retract within the mouth, and the muscles in its brain would rub along the jaws to allow the mouth to push forward to attack its prey. Xenomorph used their their outer mouth to attack anyone, while their inner mouth was typically reserved for attacking anyone who was physically close to the xenomorph. Their secondary jaws could destroy anyone and anything, and a xenomorph had one lashed out at a yauja and carved a hole in its skull by attacking it. One particular xenomorph, known as the Predalien, could even use its inner mouth to directly shove a chestburster embryo into a host's mouth, showing that these creatures' mouths held tremendous amounts of strength. This Predalien later became the Queen Xenomorph, and it's likely that all queens had this ability. 
Dorsal spines. The xenomorph had several appendages on their back that could serve any purpose. There are several plausible reasons for these dorsal spines, and they could be sensory or communication organs, or even just be a part of their defensive mechanisms. There is also a theory that suggests that these spines provide them with structure to carry their bodies to young ones. And another theory suggests that these back appendages serve as radar that help them detect movement. It is allegedly believed that these spines secrete and store the resin that they would then use in order to create hives or cocoons. The spines of the xenomorph drones managed to break through the ground surface even when these creatures bury themselves, which further confirms that they serve some special function. There are countless theories regarding these dorsal spines, and it's even believed that these spines are also strong or weak depending on how dominant a xenomorph is. They also suggest that xenomorphs may have an amphibious origin, and it's also assumed that these spines help them to blend in with the hive web during an attack. It's also hypothesized that the chestbursters latch onto these spines for support, and another theory proposes that the xenomorph's echolocation function also works with the help of these dorsal spines, which help them sense vibrations. Some other ideas suggest that these spines help carry the unhatched eggs, distribute pheromones, and even help the xenomorph balance its body. Since the xenomorph's jaws don't really help with breathing, it is also assumed that these dorsal spines help them to breathe. Xenomorphs that are classified as runners, that is, xenomorphs that are born from a dog or any other host body that uses four legs to support their structure, do not have these dorsal spines. intelligent is the xenomorph. Xenomorphs typically have the same intelligence level as most primates, and they could grasp concepts to learn to use things in their environment without too much effort. While they were not as intelligent as humans, the xenomorph queen did showcase the ability to use technology and operate mechanical tools such as elevators. The xenomorphs were required to put in a lot of effort to learn to operate machinery. Most of the time, they showed excellent creative thinking skills and figured out ways to go about using technology. During one such instance, the xenomorphs were trapped inside a container, and they decided to kill one of the weakest companions so that their blood would eat through the room floor and hence free them. Adult xenomorphs also had the ability to inherit the physical appearances of their host bodies, and it's entirely possible that they also gained their intelligence level. There is also a chance that the intelligence level of xenomorphs varied across their types, and it was suggested that they typically operate with a hive mind mentality. Their collective consciousness would be controlled by their queen, who could control them and even order them through telepathic connections. Sometimes, the queen mother xenomorph would even communicate with potential host bodies by sending them nightmares or religious visions. These visions led to the formation of some cults that worshipped the xenomorphs, and even considered them to be a god-level entity. Besides intelligence, the xenomorph also showed some emotions that would even communicate their pain through shrieks and screams. Xenomorphs' hive minds also had a collective memory system that could be passed on to the next generations, and this was studied through the tests that were done on Ellen Ripley. They discovered that the memory passed down across generations enabled them to understand several languages. The xenomorphs also managed to pick up new information through observational learning, which shows that they were intelligent creatures. In the event of danger, they even showed excellent creative thinking skills and would find out-of-the-box solutions to their problems. They knew that their acidic blood could break through most human confinements, and they didn't hesitate to use it as a weapon. They even moved through ventilation systems or other small spaces in order to sneak around or escape any situation, and they even displayed some military tactics. They knew how to use the darkness in order to camouflage themselves or flee from any situation, and they were pretty vigilant when it came to evading attacks. What is the corrosive fluid that xenomorphs secrete? Xenomorphs' bodies secrete an acidic fluid that was typically called acid blood, and it's not really known if this fluid actually carried any nutrients or whether it could be classified as blood or not. The fluid was highly concentrated, and there were very low chances that it carried any oxygen. Xenomorphs could survive in a vacuum without oxygen, and Bishop had once mentioned that the fluid no longer remains acidic after the creature dies of oxidation. Both these facts point to the suggestion that the acid blood did not contain any oxygen. However, oxidation is a term used for the loss of electrons, and it doesn't necessarily refer to any reaction with oxygen. It is plausible that the acidic blood did carry oxygen, and we cannot rule this out. The acidic blood was also corrosive in nature, and it could dissolve pretty much any and all surfaces, except for the xenomorph body, of course. Xenomorphs were well aware of the fact that their blood was deadly to all creatures, and they would use their acidic blood to attack their opponents. In one such instance, a xenomorph used its corrosive blood to attack a yauja, but some yaujas could defend themselves from this corrosive fluid 
wood by their specialized weapons. It was also suggested that this corrosive blood was nothing but a way for the xenomorphs to protect themselves, as it was a liquid stored underneath their skin with the sole purpose of harming anyone who caused physical harm to the alien creature's body. Other sources suggest that the liquid helped the fluid boost their metabolism, while others even suggested that this acidic blood probably serves as a stomach acid that allows them to digest food. According to this theory, the xenomorph digestive system would actually spread all over its body as the fluid was found all across its body. The fluid immediately dissolved anything in its path and then distributed its remains all over the xenomorph's body with the help of acid vessels. In the Alien vs. Predators Requiem documentary titled Science of the Alien, it was suggested that this corrosive liquid was hydrosulfuric acid due to its corrosive properties as well as the effect it had on humans. The Alien's Aftermath comics further revealed a new radioactive variant of the xenomorphs, and the creature's body fluids were even more lethal than the acid blood. Their bodies contained a liquid they could be compared to liquid nitrogen, and this liquid froze and even shattered the arm of a Renegade XM member. This liquid nitrogen fluid also made the xenomorphs more lethal, and it became even more impossible to kill these creatures. These radioactive xenomorphs and their liquid nitrogen blood further showed the extent of which these creatures were altered by experiments on them, which further established them as the most dangerous alien species. Can Xenomorphs Reproduce? Exploring the Complex Xenomorph Life Cycle While H.R. Giger is known for creating characters that are inspired by reproductive organs, the Xenomorph actually doesn't seem to have any genitalia. They didn't have any prominent features in order to distinguish between male and female Xenomorphs, and one could only confirm that a Xenomorph is female when they're declared a queen. There is a chance that these characters might not even have a gender, and there is a lot of debate among fans about the fact that the only confirmed female, the queen, is created from a special facehugger. In any case, the Xenomorph had a very complex life cycle, which consisted of multiple stages. Stage 1, Ovomorphs Ovomorphs, also known as the eggs, were known as the first stage in the life cycle of the Xenomorphs. The Xenomorph Queen laid large, leathery eggs that were almost 2 to 3 feet long, and they also had a four-lobed opening in the top of its head. These eggs were covered with many layers of membrane, and they could also nourish themselves with the help of nutrients from the ground. These eggs consisted of the Xenomorph Hatchling, known as the Facehugger, who was well protected under a thick layer of flesh. When the egg was in the vicinity of a host's body, these flesh layers would peel off, and the four lobes would open to release the facehugger. Facehuggers could typically sense creatures nearby and only emerge out of the shell when they found a suitable host body. The queen could sometimes even lay eggs that contained four facehuggers inside. These creatures developed sense organs and even had the ability to distinguish between organic beings and synthetic life forms before even hatching out of the egg. Eggs could also be produced by a process known as egg morphing, also known as ovomorphing. During this process, xenomorphs generated an egg when the queen would not lay eggs. Typically, a xenomorph drone would find hosts and then cocoon them in their resin in order to provide their bodies with the enzymes and growth hormones required to shape into an ovomorph. Typically, any human victim, dead or alive, could turn into an ovomorph through this process, as the drone injected their body with genetic material and enabled them to incubate a facehugger. Stage 2, Facehugger In the second stage, the facehuggers attached themselves to their host's face immediately after laying the egg. They would impregnate their hosts orally by implanting a xenomorph embryo through a tube that went down their host's throat. They could typically latch themselves to their hosts by wrapping their tails around them, and then proceed to shove its embryo down their throat. Sometimes, the facehugger even used a paralytic chemical to render them unconscious, before finally inserting a proboscis down their throat. The proboscis created a comfortable environment for the embryo, and the facehuggers were quite efficient creatures who were impossible to get rid of. If a host tried to separate themselves from these creatures, the facehugger would use its tail to suffocate them. The host couldn't even attack the facehugger, as their acidic blood would only prove to be fatal for them. After having secured the embryo within the host's body, the facehugger detached themselves from the face and died. The host typically ended up falling into a short coma after this, and then they would wake up and feel extreme hunger due to the embryo's need for nutrients. They even suffer from short-term memory loss, typically caused due to the lack of oxygen from when the facehuggers wrap their tails around the host's bodies. There were different types of facehuggers, and one such type was the royal facehuggers, who planted embryos that grew into queens or praetorians, who eventually got promoted to the queen position. Giant facehuggers, also known as the queen facehuggers, were actually not related to queens and were usually there for some other added protection. When one facehugger tried to implant an embryo in the host's body, these giant facehuggers used their legs and tails to hold the host in position and ensured that the impregnation process moved smoothly. Infectoid facehuggers were another type of facehuggers who would actually fuse themselves to a host's body and then turn them into undead beings. 
Stage 3, Chest Burster. The chest bursters, quite literally, spread like a tumor that spreads through the host body and then forces the host body to create an infant body with its own biological material. In this manner, the embryos end up with physical traits that are similar to their host's body, and this process is known as the DNA reflex. Over a period of one to several days, the tumor grows into the creature known as the chest burster by merging the embryo and the host's DNA material. This process is quite painful for the host's body, as these creatures quite literally chew their way through the host's chest. After growing into a chest burster, these creatures then rip apart the host's chest and emerges out of their body. The host typically dies during the process due to the cancerous nature of the chest burster's creation, while the chest burster runs away to find a safe place to morph into an adult xenomorph. However, chest bursters are typically quite vulnerable at this stage in their life cycle, and they can be easily killed by snapping its neck. These creatures could even climb on walls or ceilings, so they rush to find safe spots to complete their life cycle before they were killed. Sometimes, these chest bursters turn into cocoons and even shed their skin while morphing into adult xenomorphs and growing limbs. In some cases, it was seen that the chest bursters emerged from the host's body with fully formed limbs, and this was typically seen amongst the runners. In some cases, it was seen the chest bursters emerging from the host's abdomen, in which case they were referred to as belly bursters. These creatures were formed when the host was pregnant, enabling the alien embryo to grow inside the womb by feeding on the fetus. This was typically observed among predalians, who managed to impregnate the host by providing them multiple embryos at one that later latched himself to the host's womb and turned out to be belly bursters. There were no restrictions that only a single belly burster could grow inside a womb, which made it convenient for further queens to create an entire hive at once. Stage 4 – Adult In the final stage of their life cycle, the chest bursters turn into adult xenomorphs in a matter of only a few hours. There is a huge increase in their body mass, and it's assumed that the chest bursters required a good amount of food in order to complete this stage of the cycle. In the Nostromo, chest bursters raided the food locker in order to nourish themselves during this stage. The most common forms of adult xenomorphs were drones, who served as the primary assault cast. Drones were also fast and strong creatures, responsible for gathering new hosts in order to produce more xenomorphs, and they were identified due to their smooth or rigid heads and their presence of blades on their arms. Initially, the very first drone had a smooth head and a body that stood on two legs, as well as a tail and spines on its back. After a period of time, drones developed ridges as well, and there were some differences among them. There were other common casts of xenomorphs known as runners or stalkers. Another different type of xenomorph was found in Antarctica, and they typically walked on all fours and had short tails with a curved barb at the end. They even had shorter ends, and these xenomorphs were created with the help of the predators. Xenomorphs typically laid hundreds of eggs, and they always kept evolving in order to adapt to their new environments. There was a lot of genetic variation amongst the population, which thereby resulted in the creation of a number of subtypes. Xenomorph reproduction method is truly horrifying. There is a new subspecies of xenomorph that reproduces in a terrifying manner, which makes all earlier xenomorph reproduction seem like child's play. When a bunch of survivors were running into the beta station in one of the comics, one of the survivors, named Simon, decided to enter a mine in the hopes of finding someone he might know. When he entered the mine, he saw that all the people of the beta station were cocooned in some webs, while alien eggs were lying below them. These aliens were missing body parts, while some of them were completely covered in the webs and their bodies could not even be figured out. Simon tried to open one of the cocoons in order to find his loved one, but he discovered that the human body inside the cocoon was bloated and that the body had a new type of xenomorph growing inside it. He was horrified to learn that the xenomorph had resorted to using humans to incubate for an entire room full of new xenomorph species. When the alien babies had grown completely within the human body, they would tear their way out of the body, which later resulted in torn limbs for the humans. The humans were also kept alive until the xenomorphs were ready to come out of the bodies, and the alien babies used their humans as a support system in order to grow into an adult. The humans had to endure their process within their bodies and then struggle even more when the xenomorphs tore through their bodies to come out. Adult xenomorphs typically ambushed humans who entered the room and then forced their mouths open. The tiny xenomorphs then used their sharp mouths to bury their way down the human's neck and then nest in their body and start a new growth cycle. The entire process was extremely painful for the hosts, and it was certainly a lot more brutal than the way facehuggers or chestbursters reproduced.
was the xenomorph design made to resemble the male genitalia. Fans have noticed that the xenomorph seems to resemble the male genitalia, and this design choice was certainly well intended. This detail might not be entirely evident since these creatures mostly lurk in the dark, but the xenomorphs were designed by Swedish artist H.R. Giger, who is known for his organic art styles that seeks inspiration from sexual organs. Giger also used the male genitalia as his inspiration to design these alien creatures, which is certainly quite evident, especially in the side shots of the xenomorphs. A Tale of Different Xenomorph Tales Xenomorph tails were typically seen as an offensive weapon, and these creatures sometimes stood on their hind legs in order to capture their victims with their arms and then attack them with their tails. They could impale their victims with their tails, and it was observed that these tails were not needed for them to balance their bodies, but rather to attack their victims. Since the xenomorphs could balance on their hind legs, their tails served as efficient weapons that helped them to knock out their opponents and even reach them from a distance before finally attacking them. The xenomorph could also use its tail in order to sneak up on its victims, and it was pretty hard to locate its tail coming out of the darkness to attack someone. Their tails were quite deadly, and it could spray acid blood and harm everything and everyone in its vicinity if it was cut off. These alien creatures even used the spikes on their tails as weapons, and the Yauja were even known for harvesting their bones to create weapons. The xenomorph tails differed across Ridley Scott and James Cameron's versions of the alien films. In Scott's original movie, these creatures had long barbed tails that were typically curved at the end, thereby resembling an insect's limb. On the other hand, the xenomorph's tails were upgraded in James Cameron's alien films, wherein they had tails with huge spinal barbs and stingers that could even impale their enemies. The Queen Alien had even used this stinger to impale Lance Henriksen's Bishop, as well as a Yauja in the Alien vs. Predator films. How many fingers did the Xenomorphs have? In the movies, Xenomorphs are typically seen with six fingers on each hand. They had unusual hands, and they typically used two thumbs and two sets of joint fingers. They also had one thumb on each side of their two paired of joint fingers. But some Xenomorphs also had one thumb and four fingers. Their second thumb appeared to be missing, and there were other type of Xenomorph that only had four fingers altogether. Their hands seemed very creepy due to the joint fingers, and they hardly resembled the human hands within their body. Xenomorphs typically had six fingers, and this design was kept constant across all the movies, but it was seen that the Xenomorph had only four fingers in the Alien Resurrection movie. There is a chance that they only had four fingers due to the human DNA within their bodies, but it's also possible that this is just an inconsistent detail that went unnoticed during production. Culture and caste systems among xenomorphs. The xenomorph typically had a caste system that is also among other creatures such as bees and ants. A primary classification among xenomorphs was in terms of drones and warriors. Furthermore, there were special xenomorphs called Praetorians, whose only job was to protect the current xenomorph queen. Drones were also the worker xenomorphs, who were given the responsibility of finding new host bodies and also maintaining their hives. They also created their own nests by using a special fluid that was secreted by a particular organ. Typically, they were six to seven feet tall tall while standing, but their actual height was 14 to 15 feet, when we include their tall tails. They stood on their hind legs, and their head domes were smooth and without ridges. They were smaller than warriors, and they were also not as dangerous as other xenomorphs. They could also spray their acidic blood over short distances, and they were less powerful than the warriors. The warriors were the protectors of the hive, and they were typically the children of the current hive queen. They were a lot more intimidating than the drones, and they were also around 8 feet tall while standing on their hind legs. Warriors looked just like the drones, with the exception exception that they had ridges on their head domes. If we include their tails, these creatures were 14 to 16 feet long. Usually, there were four warriors that served the queen and protected the hive, but the queen would typically release pheromones that would turn these warriors into Praetorians. Warriors were potential successors to the Praetorians, and the queen had the power to turn them into Praetorians in the face of danger. Praetorians were stronger than the warriors and the drones, and they were considered to be the royal guards. They had to guard important locations to the hive, and they were primarily concerned with the queen's safety. These xenomorphs were usually found within the queen's chambers, and they had a crown-shaped crest that was similar to the queen. They were also quite huge, and were created by using special eggs with the help of the royal facehuggers. The royal facehuggers had a unique genetic code called the royal jelly line, 
and the queen herself handed this over to the facehugger. Most Praetorians were created with the help of these special eggs, but sometimes they could even be promoted from the warrior caste if the queen desired to do so. In this event, the warrior was attacked by the rest of the xenomorphs and then banished by the hive. If the warrior managed to survive on its own, it would gain a head crest, and only then would be worthy of serving as a Praetorian. Sometimes, these Praetorians acted as immature queens of the hive who would eventually be promoted to the position of queen. The queen was the most intelligent amongst all the xenomorphs, and she was also known for growing as tall as 100 feet tall. She would lay a number of eggs that would eventually grow into xenomorphs, and she typically lived under the security of the hive. The queen was essentially the most dangerous member of the hive, and she was well protected by the Praetorian guards at all times. She was even adept at navigating technology, and she was known for moving at fast speeds. She typically attacked her opponents with a four-clawed arm, and she also had a bladed tail. The queen even used her jaws to attack her opponents, but it was seen that the queen also went into an immobile state while being attached to her egg sac. During this time period, she was especially vulnerable to attacks. While queens were known for their heights, some of them would grow twice as tall as the regular drone, and they required time in order to grow to a tall height. On average, they were 15 to 20 feet tall, but they could grow up to 100 meters tall. Queens were created with the help of the royal facehuggers that created Praetorians. After the death of a queen, one of the Praetorians underwent a transformation and took her place. The queen also provided the royal facehuggers with a genetic code known as the royal jelly line, which ensured that all the future generations of Praetorians and queens retained the physical features of the queen. In this manner, it is said that the queen is the only pure-blooded xenomorph, while other xenomorphs gain some characteristics of their host bodies. Along with the queen, the xenomorphs also have an empress, who essentially rules over the entire planet hives. While the queen wears a crown with three points, the empress's crown had five points. There are some other xenomorphs known as the carriers, ravagers, crushers, and lurkers, and all these creatures perform specific tasks for the hive and the queen. Is the Xenomorph Durable? Xenomorphs were extremely durable creatures, who were essentially known as living weapons. They were primarily known for their offensive approach when it came to attacking someone, and their bodies were highly durable and agile after reaching adulthood. An adult Xenomorph was known for being stealthy, and these creatures would wait in a dormant state to lure their prey in before finally using their tail to impale their victims before they could even figure out what was going on. They usually sneaked up on their victims from behind, and they were skilled at camouflaging themselves in order to lure their prey. They typically blended within their nest walls, or even hid in the open in an artificial environment that resembled their appearance. These creatures also familiarized themselves with the darkness, and they often lurked in the shadows while waiting to find a new prey. They were also known for standing strong, even after being attacked, and their bodies could survive huge levels of physical damage without any consequences. A xenomorph queen once even survived after a multi-eon exosuit fell on her from a great height. These creatures could continue living even after being stabbed or even shot in the head, and they could also survive after losing their limbs. They also were agile creatures, and they could climb through ceilings and walls quite freely. Their bodies could endure harsh weather conditions, and they could survive in extreme temperatures and even in a vacuum. They could also swim as well as survive in water, and their ability to endure harsh environments was not limited to just a short period of time. In fact, these creatures could even stay in a vacuum for indefinite periods of time. Their bodies did not radiate any heat, and their exoskeleton temperature matched the temperature of their surroundings. Xenomorphs were also known for salivating a lot, and they sometimes had the ability to spit acid that had been stored in special glands in their bodies. They typically spit acid in order to blind their victims and not really poison them. Xenomorphs did not have visible eyes, and they probably relied on sound in order to navigate their surroundings. In this manner, they are similar to bats that use echolocation in order to see their environment. This also might be the reason why these creatures constantly keep hissing. It was also said that the xenomorphs could at least detect light and darkness, and they used electroreception in order to sense their prey's electromagnetic field. They could detect a specific animal's electromagnetic field and then use their electroreception in order to locate their prey's location by focusing on their heartbeats. This even provides an explanation as to why these characters could always detect humans, and they could also sense their victims' pheromones in order to determine whether or not they have already been infected. The xenomorphs were also known for producing a thick resin that enabled them to build hives and cocoons. These creatures typically used cocooning as a reproduction technique, and their human victims were often caught up in their reproductive process. Xenomorphs were extremely durable creatures that could even grow into full-size creatures after being deposited in a human body in the form of larva. <laughs> Ha! <laughs> 
How can a Xenomorph be killed? Xenomorphs were typically vulnerable to heat, and they could be killed with the help of flamethrowers or even Molotov cocktails in order to kill them. These creatures would die due to the heat exposure at any stage of their life cycle, except for the Xenomorph known as a Predalien, which can secrete a layer of liquid that makes its body resistant to heat. However, the Predalien could again be hurt by high temperatures, as its body would feel the pain even if it can't be burned. Exposing Xenomorphs to extreme high and low temperatures also causes their exoskeleton to suffer from a thermal shock. When it comes to the Xenomorph Queen, fire seems to be an effective strategy to defeat her. Xenomorphs could typically be killed by using weapons such as small firearms, but this was not a fail-safe method of getting rid of them. In some circumstances, the Xenomorph's body was highly vulnerable to pistol shots, while they were untouched by such attacks on other occasions. High-powered weapons, such as the M41A pulse rifle, could even explode these alien creatures' bodies, and they were also vulnerable to the high-energy beam weapons that were typically used by Yauja. They could also be killed with the help of melee weapons, but there is a good chance that these weapons could dissolve as soon as they touch their acidic blood. When Xenomorphs showed up at a scene in a large group, they could be defeated by firing constant shots with the help of a pulse rifle, since plasma weapons primarily worked as an effective tool to kill them. Typically, it is seen that Xenomorphs are easier to kill when they appear in a group, and hence, it is much more challenging to kill a lone Xenomorph than to take out an entire horde of them. How different was the Neomorph introduced in Alien Covenant? In the 2017 film Alien Covenant, we were introduced to the Neomorphs that existed before the Xenomorphs. These creatures had some distinguishing features, and the Neomorphs significantly differed from the Xenomorphs due to their ability to dislocate their entire jaw and then extend it outwards. By extending their jaws, Xenomorphs could bite limbs and even bite their victims' heads off, and they were also very speedy creatures who posed a threat to anyone who ever dared to cross their path. Neomorphs were created as the result of a local ecosystem on a distant planet, where a black liquid led to the creation of the fungus-like egg sacs to grow within the ground. These egg sacs would then release a bunch of microscopic insect-like spores whenever they were disturbed, and these spores would attach themselves to a host body by entering through the body through any openings such as nostrils or even ear canals. This process had some similarities with the Xenomorph chestburster, but Neomorphs appeared as organic creatures, who did not have any biomechanical features like the Xenomorphs. After emerging from the host's body, Neomorphs had arms and legs, as well as a gigantic head that tapered off at a pointy shape. Neomorphs were also known for their pale white skin, and some of these creatures even had very distinct physical appearances. Neomorphs also had thick yellow blood, but their blood did not share the same acidic property as the Xenomorphs' acidic blood. Neomorphs were also a lot more violent and feral than Xenomorphs, who preferred to be stealthy around their prey. Even the Neomorph infants were shown for their aggressive nature, and these creatures were also a lot less intelligent than the Xenomorphs. Neomorphs did sneak up on their victims at times, but they were stealthy to some extent. One notable difference between the Xenomorphs and the Neomorphs lies in the fact that the Neomorphs would typically feed on human flesh after killing their prey. There is a theory that Xenomorphs didn't need to feed on human flesh like the Neomorphs, Neomorphs, who needed to consume the flesh in order to survive. Neomorphs' bodies did not have an extendable inner jaw that was part of the Xenomorphs' physiology, but these creatures had gums that could extend out in order to attack their prey. Theories also suggest that the engineers had created the black liquid mutagen because they wanted to create hybrid creatures, such as the Neomorph, so that these creatures could get rid of all non-botanical animal life within the ecosystem. Since Neomorphs fed on their prey, this was quite an effective way of wiping out animals within an ecosystem, and Neomorphs could even differentiate between synthetic androids and humans. While xenomorphs typically attacked synthetic androids, neomorphs were more animalistic in nature, and they stuck to attacking humans or animals. Typically, a neomorph's life cycle extends across five stages, wherein they take the form of the neomorphic egg sacs, moats, bloodbuster, and neophytes, before finally turning into the neomorphs. <laughs> Conclusion. To sum it up, Xenomorphs were extremely dangerous beings, and their unique physiological characters truly made them the center of attention in the franchise. The creators were exceptionally detail-oriented when working on the Xenomorphs anatomy, and it certainly resulted in the creation of a dangerous alien species. What are your thoughts on the Xenomorphs? Let us know in the comment section below, and if you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to leave us a like, and subscribe if you haven't already. Until next time, have a good one, and be safe.